The Onyx Caves Part 1 From Cave Regions of the Ozarks and Black Hills by Luella Agnes Owen Recorded for LibriVox Coffee Break Collection, Volume 3 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org The Onyx Caves Part 1 From Cave Regions of the Ozark and Black Hills by Luella Agnes Owen. Northwest of Hot Springs, there is a group of three onyx caves, the distance to them being estimated at from seven to ten miles, if the party does not get lost, which is the usual fate of those who dispense with the service of a driver familiar with the country. In going, the longer way over the hilltops claims a preference on account of distant views with a favorable light. When the onyx cave ranch is reached, its scenery is found to be charming, with an ideal log house overlooking the canyon, and itself overlooked by the rising slope of the wooded hill. The entrance to the cave is in the opposite wall of the canyon, and is covered by a small cabin, at the door of which the view demands a pause for admiration. Then the party disappears down a narrow, rough, sloping passage of sufficient height for comfort to none but know the value of comparative degrees. It soon appeared, however, that personal comfort would travel only a short distance. The mud increased with every step, and in its midst was a small hole through which it was necessary to pass to the next lower level. This hole being so small, and its walls slanting, the only way to accomplish the first half of the descent was to sit down in the mud and slide, stopping halfway to examine a fine ledge of beautiful striped onyx, white and a brownish pink the first outcrop in the cave, but in the next level it is seen in rich abundance and variety, the colors being red, black, and white, brown in several shades, and pure white. All are handsome and of commercial quality and hardness, and just above them is a ledge of fine blue marble. The next chamber is called the Badlands, on account of a certain resemblance to that desolate region. The way into it is through the Devil's Corkscrew, a most uninviting passage because it stands on end and is about twelve feet deep with circular perpendicular walls discouragingly free of prominent irregularities but careful study reveals a few available crags and rough edges by which the descent is made fortunately the party decreased in size just within the entrance climbing up into a hole in the wall of this room with no little difficulty the aerial lake is the reward of a breathless upward struggle and a satisfying one. The lake is very small, but under its clear surface can be seen numerous growing deposits of calcite, while the roof of onyx gleams with a mass of small white stalactites. Returning again to the main route and traveling to the end of a short passage, we beheld the entrance to Red Hall, a piece of rope ladder dangling halfway down a perpendicular wall the other half having no help whatever. The way was clear so far as the length of the ladder, and with trust in the future soon learned in cave work that distance was at once past, and sitting on the very narrow ledge to cogitate on the possibility of further progress, Mr. Sidey solved the problem by suggesting, rather doubtfully, that the easiest way would be to drop off and allow him to interrupt the fall. This method had twice proved the only means of advance in Wind Cave, and can be termed rapid transit. The walls of Red Hall are of stratified limestone variegated with patches of red rock and clay of the same gay hue. It is the highest chamber in the cave, and probably the largest. A hole in the wall at the floor level, near the entrance to the passage beyond, gives a glimpse of the cave river flowing on a slightly lower level, not over two feet below the floor we stand on. The water is said to have a depth of fifteen feet, and a rock thrown in gave back the sound of a splash into water not shallow. Entering the passage already referred to, its dimensions decreased to a crawl, and then to a squeeze, so that most of its length was taken in a very humble position, which permitted no regard to be paid to the ample mud or little pools of water that must be serenely dragged through, as if carrying them away were an agreeable privilege. Even a muddy passage ends in time, and at last we gained a standing point, and after a short climb were in Fairy's Palace, a marvel of dainty beauty, 
and worthy of the distasteful trip just taken. We stood in a narrow passage that divided the small chamber, like the central aisle of a cathedral, above which the white roof formed a gothic arch, from which depended countless little stalactites and draperies, while on either side, six feet above the passage, was a floor of onyx supporting exquisite columns, of which the highest were not more than three feet. Only a short distance from the fairy's palace is the most equally beautiful ethereal hall, and connecting the two I had the pleasure to discover a small arched passage more beautiful than either. Although much of the cave was still not visited, the long drive to town demanded a return to the surface, but several stops were made on the way to admire masses of onyx and groups of curious forms in deposits of that fine stone. One high, crooked chimney above the corkscrew is especially fine and correspondingly difficult for a grown person weighted down with garments dripping mud and water. But Kimball Stone, our boyfriend, scampered up like a squirrel. Two of the onyx caves had not been seen at all, and Mr. Sidey expressed special regret on account of the latest discovery, as no woman had ever yet entered it. But the sun was low in the west, and the road had some dangerous points that must be passed before dark, so the reeking skirt was removed, and without waiting to dry by the great fire kindled for the purpose, we hurried off, promising to return if possible, and carrying treasures in specimens, besides an ancient lemon, which may not be called a fossil, since soft substances are said not to fossilize. But however that may be, this is a perfect lemon whose particles have been replaced with the lasting rock in the same way as the numerous cycad trunks in the same region have been preserved to prove to us conclusively that formerly the region flourished under tropical conditions and supported an abundant animal life of tropical nature and habits. Soon after leaving the ranch, we descended by a sort of goat trail road into a grandly beautiful canyon, along the bed of which the road continues until it flows out as the water did in ages gone. By this time it had become quite dark, and the chill of the northwest night formed a combination with saturated clothing that cannot be highly recommended as a pleasure. But the natural chivalry which prompted our young escort to insist on lending his own coat and his evident disappointment that the sacrifice was not allowed, afforded a pleasure that will continue. End of The Onyx Caves Part 1 Read by Tricia G.